What is your biggest dream? What's the first thing that popped into your mind when I asked you this question? What's your dream? Well, when I was a little kid, I always had the, the dream uh, to uh, change something about all the injustices in the world. From a very early age on, I was always sad when something unjust happened in a micro scale or a macro scale. And then when I was uh, 18 years old, I, um, I s still wanted to do something for the world, but I really didn't know what exactly. So what do you do when you're 18 years old? You don't know what to do. You go traveling, of course. <laughs> so I, uh, I went uh, traveling and I quickly discovered something very interesting. And it's uh, a thing that really draw me in the right direction. And it's called permaculture. What a strange name. Um, it's, it means perma, permanent agriculture. And all the frustrations I had, all the things that I thought were wrong in the world kind of came together in this permaculture. Um, so my, in my mind, it was very clear. I was going to become a permaculture farmer. Um, I first started experimenting in the south of France, where I uh, lived for a couple of years uh, on a small scale, just for myself uh, and my wife. And then later on, when I went back to Belgium, I said, OK, now I'm going to start my farm. And I started to talk to some professors, uh, to some people, to Piet van Temse. And uh, then I showed this, um, or I talked about my farm. And then they said, OK, well, very good, biodiversity resilient health, but permaculture is never going to provide enough food, never going to provide enough income, and it's not scalable at all. Um, I'm very sorry, but that's not very realistic. So I was, my dream of becoming a farmer was shattered. Uh, and then I asked the question, but then the, the farms around here, what are the KPIs of these farms? And it's, uh, well, they provide enough food, that's for sure. They're very scalable. The income is debatable, but all the other three, th that's... No biodiversity, not climate resilient, not very healthy. You saw the beautiful drawings on Elsa's pre presentation. So I was kind of, uh, yeah, in an impasse. I didn't know what to do. And as you see, I had a problem. I wanted to start a farm, but you need money for a farm. A hectare costs around 100,000 euros. Um, and if I was, for example, going to grow grains on it, it would take me more than 200 years to pay back this 100,000 euros. So that was not really an option. Uh, so I did not have a future perspective, no drive. And that's when I realized that there's something wrong with the agricultural system. So I went on and asked a lot of people what I should do. I was a naive young guy. So I just asked everybody. I uh, asked Alain Peters. I asked Piet van Temse. I asked a lot of people who are not here, but are professors in the United States, farmers. Uh, captains of the industry, and I combined it in my first book, We Eaten on Stolt, We Eat Ourselves to Death. And I'm so happy because I found an answer to my question. It took me a long time, and um, it uh, was an emotional roller coaster because sometimes I was on a very high, I saw very beautiful projects, and then I went to talk with Bayer and Monsanto, and then I was like, oh my God, uh, these people, they think they're doing the right thing, and they're very good people. Um, but in my opinion, it's in the wrong paradigm they want to do the right thing. So um, I found a revelation I'm going to share with you. But first, I want to go back in time. You see these three pictures. On the left, what do we have? Somebody? Louder? Participation? Romans? Yes, Roman Empire. The middle? Easter Island. Easter Island. On the right? Chichen Itza, Mayas. What do they have in common? Anybody knows? Stones? They're old? Unsustainable? They're all big empires, and they all collapsed. And how did they collapse? This is how they collapsed. They didn't treat the soil as they had to treat it as of course, history is a lot of things coming together, but that's one of the main ingredients why they collapsed the soil. They didn't take care of the soil. There were these huge empires, and they thought, well, everything is possible. We are gods. And that's actually what we're thinking right now. Everything is possible. We drive around with our Teslas, have these iPhones. Fantastic. But what are we going to eat? 
uh, we cannot eat our Teslas and iPhones. <laughs> so my question is, guess who's next? And on the left side, you see Spain, this is California, and this is Belgium. It's not something, well, we have, we're going to have problems in the future. No, we're having problems last year, two years ago, three years ago. There are villages in France where they have to bring in trucks with bottled water because there's no water coming out of the tap because we depleted the water. So we have to do something. And as else beautifully explained, after the Second World War, we needed a lot of food. We said never hunger again, so we intensified. We had a lot of uh, explosive that we could not sell anymore, so we decided, well, what can we sell it for? Oh, we can make fertilizers out of them. The same with this uh, chemical warfare uh, ingredients. Well, we can stop killing humans, but we start, can start killing bugs instead. So that's actually what happened. And they intensified, used chemistry, have a lot of yields per acre, fantastic, very grateful. That's the reason why we're all here today. Um, so we had no more hunger, but the same ingredients will lead us back to hunger again. Let's get back to the basics. What is agriculture? What does a plant need? Because agriculture, it's very simple. It's growing plants. You can say, yeah, but it's also growing animals. But what do animals eat? Plants. So what does a plant need? Nutrients. Water. Sun. Carbon. What else? Come on. Phosphorus, potassium, micronutrients. So they need a lot of things. And how do they actually grow? It's actually very simple. So a plant you can see as a little factory. They have leaves and the leaves are like solar panels. They take up energy from the sun and then their machines start working and they assemble all kinds of stuff. They take water from the soil. They take CO2 from the air. Anybody knows if you combine water and CO2 what you get? It's very crazy. Sugar. So water plus CO2 is sugar. Fantastic. So why am I comparing plants with pancakes? <laughs> the big question. What can you find in the ingredients of pancakes? Sugar? What else? Flour? Eggs? Proteins? Fats? And why am I sharing a picture of pancakes? Is because I want you to imagine that you have a birthday party. You bake pancakes, of course. It's what any decent person do. You bake pancakes for a birthday party. And you invite some guests. If you go to a party, what do you do? If you're invited to a party, you go to the party. Yeah, you bring some presents. So the plant is actually very smart. Say, look, I'm going to bake pancakes to invite all soil life, fungi, bacteria, and they're all attracted by the pancakes, and they come. But how can a plant make pancakes, you're probably thinking? Well, a plant gives more, uh, almost up to 40% of what the plant makes for itself, gives it for free via their roots. It's called exudates, very difficult term, of root secretions. So proteins, sugars, whatever, they're giving it with their roots, and they all come to the party, to eat, and they bring something in exchange because there are a lot of nutrients in the soil that the plant cannot access. This, every, anybody of you ever went on a camping trip or on a holiday, you had a bottle of wine, but you have no wine opener. Or you had a can of, a tin can of something, and you had not an opener. Who has been in that situation? Okay, enough people, how does it feel? <laughs> Frustrating. What do you do? How did you solve your problem? With a knife? Okay. You go see your neighbor. And that's, that's, that's what the plant is thinking. Imagine you have the soil. It's full of these tin cans, full of bottle of wines. Uh, and you cannot, they cannot access it. So they have to borrow an opener. And in this case, they just organize parties. They're coming. So organizing parties. And the funny thing is, sometimes they do not make pancakes, but make waffles instead, for example. And then they attract different bacteria with different nutrients. So the plants can actually talk via the chemical exudates to these bacteria and fungi to tell what they need. And they do not only give food, but they also protect the roots of the plants against intruders. And you might say, wow, what a beautiful, harmonious system. 
You give something, you get something. But you could also call it a mafia. They give protection money in order to be protected. <laughs> and then you get the wood wide web. You get a web of plants connected via, uh, via soil organisms to nutrients, but also with each other, like in a forest, for example. And that's the most important thing, is that this soil, if you have all these little subtle animals working together, then everything works. Then the plants have their nutrients, but we, with our big, fat feet, we just say, oh, we're going to plow this field, oh, we're going to give some fertilizer, do some chemical warfare. If there's some chemical warfare, you're not going to go to a party, right? So all these little microorganisms, they just go away. And we've been living from the soil capital. Imagine you have a bank account, you just plunder it, and at the end of the day, you don't have any money left. And to say it with the words of one of my mentors, we live off capital when we should be living off our interest. Keep on skimming that interest and give parties with that interest, but don't under your bank account. And that's what we've been doing with our soils. If you go to Spain right now, you see places where the bank is totally empty and you cannot do agriculture anymore. But fortunately, all the solutions are at our fingertips. You see this root? They have this protective sock of bacteria, like aggregates, really like a sock, and they're protecting uh, the root against any intruders. You have these earthworms that are constantly plowing the soil. Let's say you have two tons of earthworms in the soil on one hectare. That's about 30 people working 24-7 for free. Don't have to pay them. They're just working. They're eating soil and they're pulling out the best fertilizer you can imagine. And they're making all these little holes and tunnels which are actually very good for the soil. And then you get soil like this. You get soil with structure opposed to soil without structure. Imagine you're living in a village and above on the hill you have a farm. Which farm do you want to be on the top of the hill? The left one or the right one? Well, if you have one on the right, that's going to end up in your living room. And that's actually happening. Here you can even see it better. And you probably all heard the stickstoff crisis, uh, the nitrogen problems in Belgium, in Holland. Well, if you have a structured soil, then the soil can, can actually help in taking on this uh, nitrogen excess. Plant health. As you see, these are all little creatures, bacteria, helping the plant, protecting the plant. And it's not only the roots, even the leaves of the plant. It's full of little creatures that protect the plants for intruders. So again, don't pay for, for, uh, don't pay for pesticides. Make sure that these leaves are covered with the good flora and fauna, and uh, with good fauna, I mean, uh, and then you don't have these problems. Water issues are solved as well. I see a bottle of spa blue water there, and I'm actually kind of thirsty. I would like to take it, but I can't reach for it. Imagine if I could make my arm 100 times longer, and I could just take that bottle and have a drink. That's what plants are doing with fungi. These fungi make plant roots 100 times longer. So if there's a drought crisis, there's not actually a drought crisis, there is a soil crisis. There's not enough fungi in the soil. And then, of course, one of my favorites, free fertilizer. Well, you, you know, this air is 78% nitrogen. What we're breathing, this is 78% just nitrogen. Imagine if we could invent a machine to take this nitrogen out of the air and then we could sell it and make a lot of profit. That would be great, right? There's actually Haber and Bosch did that. They received the Nobel Prize for it. Uh, they invented this machine. They can use it to make explosives or fertilizers. But why pay for fertilizers if you can get it for free? These clovers are only one of the many examples that can take these fertilizers out of the air and give it to the plant itself. And it's only, not only clovers, all the plants of the bee, bean family, um, a lot of trees, such as the alnus, the alce, alce <laughs> they, uh, they can take 
uh, nitrogen from the air and give it to the ground. So why pay for it if you can get it for free? That's the slogan of my entire presentation. <laughs> now, if you work together with nature, you can actually save a lot of money and energy. And we also prevent this from happening. What's the average age of a farmer right now in Belgium? Who knows? 59? Who, who, who wants to give more? Around 60. So farmers are actually dying out, literally. Nobody wants to become a farmer anymore. Um, and young farmers don't want to take over a farm because they have historical debt and there's not a big future for them. What you see in agroecological farms, that the children are actually almost fighting with each other to be able to take over the farm because there is a future. And as you see, a place like this, who wouldn't fight to take over this farm? <laughs> Your farm is 26? Wow, fantastic. Uh, and, and, and that's what's so beautiful about uh, agroecology, that it brings hope, it brings technical solutions, it's not some wishy-washy uh, thing, it's not an ideology at all. There are literally thousands of scientific papers showing all the different benefits of agroecology. It's a science, an exercise, a social movement, and most of all, it's imitating nature. To make it very easily, this is conventional agriculture. It's just... A piece of land, two-dimensional, nothing else. What do we need? Ingredients, we need seeds, of course, and then we use fertilizers because we work the ground, we take up our soil capital, so we need to fertilize, and if you uh, live on a Baxter for two years, you're gonna become sick, so then you also have to need, take extra medication, and that's also what's happening. We have kind of unhealthy uh, nutrition for the plants, they become sick, we need to give pesticides, we, have to, we work the land, we plow, we turn up the villages of all these fungi and bacteria, um, so we're in a vicious cycle. Organic, most of the organic farms uh, are actually much better than that, but if you take organic agriculture to the leather of the world, you can just do this. See the difference? Look closely. What's happening? You just do exactly the same, but you just use organic fertilizer and organic pesticides from the same company uh, and do the same practices. I'm not saying that every organic uh, farm is this. Au contraire, uh, organic farms are much better than this, but if you really want to do it, you can just do it like this. Agroecology is an entire redesign of the system, and you get away from the two dimension, you go in the three dimensions. For example, you go underground because you dig a lake or a, a pond, and you boost biodiversity. Uh, you have a lot of hedgerows, uh, a lot of trees that boost biodiversity. Um, I'm not gonna repeat all the words Al's used, why it's so uh, good, but you create this kind of system, a multi-dimensional system that actually also looks much prettier than traditional farms. And uh, a big role for it is also trees. We need to eat more trees. And the United Nations actually say that agroecology is the only way to feed the world in a sustainable manner. And now, of course, you've been all waiting to hear this revelation that actually struck me the most while I was writing my book. Something that really changed the way I looked at everything, and I hope it will change the way you look at everything as well. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever been in this discussion with people, oh, I don't buy organic, it's bullshit, or ah, organic, conventional, what's the difference? Have, you, have anybody of you been in that kind of discussion? Yeah, of, or you, you've been standing in the store and thinking, well, should I buy this tomato for two euros a kilo or for three euros a kilo? Why should I pay one euro more for these organic ones? Anybody has thought that? I did. Well. That's exactly the revelation that I want you to leave uh, this place. And here you have this vibrant young child. And I asked, how does a plant work? How does a human body work? How do we live? What do we need? Food. How do we take food? No photosynthesis, unfortunately. We have to eat, chew. You have to chew a lot, my grandmother always says. Um, so you remember like a small space, 
near the roots of plants where a lot of microorganisms come together. Does this ring a bell for someone in the human body? Do you have something similar? We actually have our gut. On the left side, you see our gut. And our gut is like a big root with little root hairs called villi, and then microvilli. And here you see the root of a plant. Imagine you take a root of the plant with your hand inside the root and you turn it upside down. Then you have human gut. The human gut is actually literally a plant root upside down with exactly the same function. Okay, Louis, you want to come here for a minute? And you. So, imagine. <laughs> oh my God. Imagine. So, humans have been a lo- around for a long time. And so, Louis, also Louis, yeah. um, he's been like eating a lot of berries, just picking berries, putting it in his mouth, um, <laughs> when he was like still kind of an ape. Um, and then it ended up in his gut. But on these berries and leaves, uh, they're all little creatures. And they all went inside his gut and they asked, Louis, can I stay? And I'm going to give you something in return. I'm going to take more iron out of it so you have more iron. In return, I just need a little bit of food. What do you say, Louis? Yes, he agrees. So they can stay. And then another one says, hey, Louis, I can take more B12 out of this uh, food. Can Can I also stay? Can I also stay? So that's what happened, you know? So Louis kept on eating berries and leaves and insects. And they had all these negotiations with these little animals. They all stayed in his gut. And now we have a gazillion of these tiny creatures in our gut that are helping him to stay healthy. And look how healthy he is. (laughs) An applause for Louis. And, and that's what happened. And the thing is, the only way to be healthy is to have a healthy gut. You see, this, our guts are full with little holes, but you have these friendly bacteria that are actually protecting intruders of getting inside these holes. If you don't have them, you have open holes, you have leaks, you have a leaky gut, for example. We have a lot of chronic diseases in the richest part of the world because we have bad gut environments. And guts and chronic diseases have a huge connection. And not only chronic diseases, also our brain. It's called the second brain. And a lot of depressions can actually be solved by having a better gut system. And that's the revelation that I was so glad about that I learned. Because you might say, well, I don't care eating pesticides. The guy from Bayer literally told me, well, Louis, these pesticides, they don't really hurt human cells. I said, yeah, oh, hmm, well, he's right. How, what, what argument can I bring into this? The pesticides, they don't hurt human cells. But we are, no, we are not humans. You are all not humans. We are more than 50% of all our cells are non-human cells. We are actually vehicles of fungi, bacteria, microorganisms that are running the show. We look like humans, but we are not. (laughs) And that's the revelation. Even the the, the tiniest amount of fungicide or pesticides you get in, they are the, the same kind of fungi that are in our body keeping us healthy that are attacked. So now I could say to the buyer guy, well, okay, you're right. They don't, they don't attack human cells, but they do attack, attack are more than 50% that are not human, and they're keeping us healthy. So for me, that was like the, the argument to end all discussion, why we need to abandon chemicals in our foods altogether. So we can only be healthy that our, when our soils are healthy. Politics, economies, drinking water, society, farmers, nature, rivers can only be healthy if our soils are healthy. So, of course, you might think, well, farmers are the big culprit. Uh, Let's go on and bash some farmers, like a lot of people do, but they're also forced into it, like Els beautifully explained. We have to respect where they are. We have to see that they have been pressured by society, but now we have to change the United Nations says that if we don't, don't do something in the next 30 years, we're all screwed. 
Uh, so let's work together with them to transform into an agroecological farming. And so we don't end up with this because that's not realistic. Sorry, permaculturists, but agroecology is the bigger butter. Uh, this is not good enough, but we need this. We need everything, and that's beautifully coming together in agroecology. And then we go from no hunger to enough food and skip the hunger again part because we never want to go there. With the Living Soil Academy, we've been training farmers to do that. I also want to like you to, to go um, and train yourself if you want to. Um, this is actually the thing that's laying on your chair, the eat more trees thing. It's actually something you can scan in, but can also eat. <laughs> and the biggest call to action I have for all of you guys it's very simple. It's only one thing you have to do, and that's buy and eat organic, biodynamic, or agroecological. Who of you eats 100% organic? Okay. Who like sometimes? Who most of the time? Who never? Never. Wow. That's actually quite good. So that's actually the, the simplest thing you can do. You, everybody eats three times a day, or if you do intermittent fasting, only two times. But every time you eat, you make this decision. You literally shape the world by choosing what you eat. So go organic first step, biodynamic second step, agroecological third step, and know your farmer. And then we can go from the left side to the right side, and that's my biggest dream. I'm curious, what's your biggest dream? You can tell me later on. Thank you.